The FCC has targeted net neutrality. The NSA stops some of their email spying. IoT vigilantes are on the rise, and Intel devices can be pwned. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I'm Shannon Morrison. This is ThreatWire from May 2nd, 2017. Your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. If you have not checked out our Patreon yet, please do so. We have lots that we want to do for the show, but of course we can't do it without your support. My next goal is to add a monthly Q&A, which is exclusively just for our patrons, and we are going to also upgrade our ThreatWire set. New camera is definitely on my list. Patreon.com slash ThreatWire is the place to support ThreatWire, and the link is in the show notes. Now on to our first story. FCC Chairman Ajit Pai is wasting absolutely no time on removing net neutrality ideas. By the way, he's on Twitter, so in case you want to share your thoughts or opinions toward him, or maybe just throw shade, I'm just saying he's there for the taking. Net neutrality has been on Pai's chopping block since before he was chairman. He's publicly spoken up against what we consider an important part of internet freedom, which is the ability for consumers to access content equally without ISP favoritism. The FCC released a 400-page document on Wednesday last week detailing their new plans, which include allowing ISPs to give or sell access to sites that pay them while blocking or slowing down others. The original FCC 2015 Open Internet Order protected those key features of internet freedom while Pi's FCC is intending to get rid of them. Now there is a 58-page fact sheet which is publicly available and linked down in the show notes for you to read. The FCC claims that before the adoption of the Obama-era net neutrality ruling, ISPs flourished, new networks were constructed at faster paces, and high-speed internet access was available at affordable rates. I don't know, mine's 60 bucks. I think it's rather affordable right now. They want to go back to this early 2000s era internet plan where government has a very light touch control over internet access and they want to allow ISPs to determine what is best for them. The FCC argues, quote, in the Title II order, despite virtually no quantifiable evidence of consumer harm, the commission nevertheless determined that it needed bright line rules banning three specific practices by providers of both fixed and mobile broadband internet access access service, blocking, throttling, and paid prioritization. So blocking legal sites, throttling sites, and paid favoritism by ISPs doesn't harm consumers? I mean, I really don't, I don't need an analyst statistical study to tell you that that's kind of a bad idea. There is a lot of questionable content in the public draft issued by the FCC and not enough time here to cover every single bit of it, but it's pretty interesting, so highly suggest that you read it. Public comments are permitted via the FCC website officially starting May 18th, but you can already go there and comment if you want to with a deadline of July 17th. Quality over quantity for the comments is recommended, though I am rather skeptical about how much weight they will actually carry in the FCC's final vote. Not surprising is the huge amount of comments on the FCC site that are obviously copied and pasted into the page from American Commitment, which is the same group that called net neutrality Marxist back in 2014. A second activist group has begun the same commenting where they're just copying and pasting, and coincidentally, as I was writing this report, the FCC site crashed and stopped loading. Isn't that strange? Hopefully it is back up when this episode posts so that we can start our own flood of quality, non-copy and pasted comments, wouldn't you say? On the other side of the spectrum, I never thought I would say that, is the NSA. What? Yeah. So starting in 2008, the NSA was using Section 702 of the FISA Act to spy on foreign targets outside of the US. Part of Section 702 in FISA also allowed for something called downstream spying, which is basically PRISM back in the day, except they just decided to rebrand it, and then upstream spying, which is communications that are to, from, or about a specific target, which could include the target's email address in the text or the body of an email that is related between two persons that are not targets themselves and not related to the entire investigation. So during the enactment of FISA, two incidents occurred where the NSA had to report unwillingly a collection of data from US people that were not targeted, but just happened to be a part of that collection. After considering current technological requirements, mission needs, and privacy interests, the NSA has decided to stop including any un upstream about collection in their data. They will also be deleting data that was previously required in this section. 
Now you may think, I have never contacted or included a criminal in my emails. I'm perfectly fine, got nothing to worry about. Why should I worry my pretty little head about privacy? So not necessarily, actually. Email providers group email traffic together during transit and that bundle of emails is picked up by the NSA in one big grouping instead of just separated out one by one and specifically targeted. This was a concern back in 2011 when it was reported and a fix was attempted by moving those bundles of emails to a separate repository for analysis, but it turns out also analysis weren't searching them correctly and they can look at private emails from people who had nothing to do with the investigation, so they didn't really fix it. Now while this is a step in the right direction to stop those about emails from being collected towards better privacy protections for US citizens, it does not solve the NSA's technical problems for investigations. At most, I kind of consider it a band-aid on an act that needs to be replaced, not amended. Also, I do want to mention PGP, pretty good privacy. It is pretty good. It's not perfect, but at least it's something. If I look really hot, it's because I am. It is super hot in the studio today because we finally got decent temperatures here in the Bay Area. But anyway, moving on. IoT botnets, those are still prevalent, but we are starting to see some new surges this past week. First off, there was BrickerBot, which bricks Internet of Things devices whenever it infects them, and it's had a resurgence. So Pascal Guinans documented the newest instance, which he dubbed BrickerBot.3 and .4, which started on April 20th. It is spurred a little under 1,400 attacks at his own research honeypot at the time of recording, and just like Mirai, these bots attack badly secured cameras, DVRs, and other Internet of Things devices. Desi Matrix over on our Patreon account points to an article about the attacker who calls him or herself Janitor, who claims to have bricked 2 million devices since January with Brick or Bot. According to Janitor, the source code for this has not been leaked, and it is still being used to this day. With that said, two other other vigilantes have come onto the scene to help with securing IoT devices, or so we think. First is Cloudflare, the infrastructure company who has been working on a fix for 18 months. They are calling their new service Orbit, which works like a VPN for IoT devices that Cloudflare will use to set up a virtual patch for the device or block connectivity from malicious devices to the vulnerable one. Obviously a drawback of this would be putting all of your trust into Cloudflare's service. The second vigilante is Hajime. It's spelled kind of like Hajime Mashite, and Hajime I believe means beginning in Japanese, uh, so I'm pronouncing it that way. If that's incorrect, well, too bad. Ajime is a white or gray hat botnet that has infected at least 300,000 devices so far and works on a decentralized network to issue encrypted updates to those infected devices while also blocking ports that are normally used as attack vectors, and it lacks DDoS capability. With that said, though, can you trust it? Is there any sort of backdoor capability? I don't know. So far, it has not been malicious in any way, but is this a Trojan horse waiting for the right moment, waiting to attack so many things that then it can attack everybody else? The best way to be safe for anybody is for the owner of an Internet of Things device to actually go in and change the password and update the firmware on the physical said device, not necessarily wait for a stranger to do it for you. In a confirmed briefing from Intel on May 1st, Intel Active Management Technology, Standard Manageability, and Small Business Technology firmwares can be hacked remotely. This affects any device with AMT, ISM, or SBT abilities from Nahalem to Kaby Lake or Kaby Lake, depending on which PR person you talk to, where the remote management is turned on. Firmware patches were released by Intel on April 25th to OEMs. If you have AMT or ISM turned on on those business devices, disable them until the firmware is available through your manufacturer. The attack could still be used locally, even with remote capabilities turned off though. Now while normal consumers don't necessarily need to worry about this on your home laptops and stuff, this can affect companies that have security systems like ATMs, medical devices, digital signs, secure cameras, etc, etc. Thank you again to all the fine people who contribute to patreon.com slash threatwire. If you can spare a few cents, every little bit helps us keep the show going completely independent and ad-free. We now have an audio-only RSS feed, extra content, and early access for our patrons, and we might even feature your fur baby in a future episode. If you cannot donate, that's totally cool too. You can hit the subscribe button or you can share this episode on your favorite social media page. And if you use the hashtag threatwire, that's 
hashtag ThreatWire. We can see it and we could retweet you. So make sure to keep those going. With that, I am Shannon Morse and I will see you on the internet.